Hello students, today we're going to be learning about genetic engineering. Um, that is the transferring genes of interest from one organism into another. What does that mean? Well, genetic engineering is this cool technology we have where we can get a cool gene, a gene that is very special from one organism. That, that's what we call the gene of interest, the gene we're interested in. From one organism, we can take it out by cutting it out and we insert it into another. And in this example, you're seeing where we have a special gene from a bacteria that um, produces a protein and that protein can uh, destroy insects so it's like a uh, insecticide and we can take that gene out from that bacteria and put it into the corn why would why would you want to do that well we're, we're basically getting that quality from that bacteria into here that never existed in the corn that means that the corn will produce the same protein that the bacteria produces and now the uh, the corn can uh, destroy insects and it won't get eaten or destroyed and that crop can last longer we'll have corn lasting longer time of the new technologies that Helen Blau is using to uncover the potential of stem cells she showed me an experiment being conducted with genetically altered mice Why not? Sure. So that is one unusual mouse. It certainly is. It has uh, green fluorescent protein in all of the cells of its body. Because we've been able to introduce the jellyfish or GFP gene into these mice, now their tissues glow. And you can see that particularly in the ears, the eyes, the tail. It's uh, but all the tissues are, are green. This has enabled us then to take cells that glow and put them into another mouse and see what tissues they participate in. So in a way you can follow what stem cells can do. It's a marker. It's a marker. And it just all you need is an ultraviolet light. That's right. And it didn't exist before. And because of that we now can follow the fates of these cells, where these cells go, what they become in a way that wasn't previously possible. That's, it is fantastic. <laughs> There's a ceiling on how much muscle mass you can add. There are true structural limits. The skin can only stretch to a certain amount. The fascia, which is the fibrous tissue that covers muscles, can only stretch to a certain amount. It appears that to really change human to Hulk, you're going to have to tamper with the genes. Which is where the real super science comes in, genetic engineering. Dr. H. Lee Sweeney of the University of Pennsylvania has already created the Hulk. Or at least, his rodent equivalent. If you sort of shaved off all the fur, there'd be no comparison. I mean, the muscles are huge in, in the treated ones versus the untreated ones. The scale tells the tale. A normal mouse weighs in at 27 and a half grams. A genetically engineered mouse, 41 grams, or 40% beefier than average. How do you get the gene into the mouse? You smuggle it in on a virus. It goes inside the cell looking like a normal virus, but lo and behold, when it opens up, it's got a new gene in there that wouldn't have normally been there. So you, you could view it as a Trojan horse if you like. The mouse gets mighty and stays that way. Their muscles never get weaker when they get old. They are just as strong when they're the equivalent of a 80 or 90 year old human as when they were the equivalent of a 20 year old. Will it work in man as in mouse? Here's how it might. The gene is called insulin growth factor 1 or IGF-1. Its genetic coding would be injected into the specific muscle you'd want to treat. That muscle would now have the ability to repair itself and grow at a supernormal rate. The probable first use of this genetic therapy in humans would be to treat muscular dystrophy. It's already started a buzz among athletes. Through email, I've been approached by a lot of people, mostly weightlifters. But even once, a uh, coach for a high school football team emailed me and asked me if I'd consider treating his whole team because uh, he thought they could benefit from being a bit stronger. Other genes could be used to make a taller, bulkier, hulkier body, even skin color. 
There is a gene that scientists actually use in mice that can turn the skin green. So if you want them to be big and green, you could do that as well. What if you somehow crossed this fearsome predator with a more gregarious animal? Something that Dr. Jeffrey Turner has already done with goats. Hello, girls. How are you today? This farm is located outside Montreal, Canada. These are very special goats. Within their genetic makeup is uh, one spider silk gene. In a spider, the gene is responsible for the making of so-called dragline silk, the strongest natural fiber known to science. Dragline is the silk favored for the radii of the web and to suspend from. It's a spider's lifeline. How do you get the gene into the goat? You start with the embryo or fertilized egg. What we do is we take a very fine glass pipette and we add just a few copies of the gene into this fertilized goat egg. What happens then when the goat egg is a single cell is that the spider silk gene becomes part of one of the chromosomes. The goats are now part spider. To be precise, they're 170,000th spider. It's not like they have eight legs or anything. But they do produce highly prized dragline silk protein. How do you get the protein out of the goat? You milk it. The goats produce silk within their mammary gland. Inside their mammary gland is a single spider silk gene. And the goat's genetic information, having this added gene, allows them to produce silk protein in their milk. Refined out of the milk, the protein yields a syrupy material called spindo. This golden solution is very much like you would see inside a spider if you could look inside her silk glands. Uh, so how was it possible that, you know, we got a jellyfish gene that was a fluorescent gene and we took it out and we put it in a mouse, made it glow? How was it possible that we got that IGF protein um, and then put it in the human and put it in the mouse and it makes them stronger? Um, how is it that we got the spider web gene out of a spider and put it into goats for them to make a spider web material through their, through their um, udders? How is that possible? Well, it's because all organisms use the same DNA. Okay, you look here, you look at this chimpanzee, you look at this human, you look at the plant. They all use DNA and their DNA contains the same bases, A, G, T, C. And... The cells just, they work the same. They read whatever code is in front of them. So picture a cell. It doesn't matter what DNA you give that cell. It's going to follow the central dogma. It's going to go from DNA to RNA to the protein that produces that special trait. So it doesn't matter where you get DNA from. I mean, they've done studies where they take DNA. You can get it from a banana and put it in another organism. And then that other organism will make banana proteins. It doesn't matter what DNA you put in the organism cells will produce that protein. Pretty cool. All right, so how does this work? So take a look here. These are the main words you need to know. And you want to copy this uh, picture down. You want to pause it and copy this whole chart down. This is what you're going to have on your quiz. Hint, hint, right there. How does this work? So here's an example of making insulin. Um, insulin, as you know, is a, is, is a hormone, and it's a protein that humans make and it reduces the sugar level. And people with diabetes have, a, have problems controlling their sugar in their blood. So a good way is when they, sometimes they don't make insulin, so we have to inject it. They have to inject it into themselves, and that's how their sugar gets lowered. So how do we make a lot of insulin so we can put it in bottles of medication and give to patients? How do we do that? Well, we need a creature that makes a lot of it. And we know we need a creature that reproduces very fast. So the best thing we can do is look at bacteria. And so it's really crazy here now because what scientists do is they get the insulin gene from a human and take that gene, cut it out, and put it in a bacteria. And you're thinking bacteria, unicellular uh, prokaryotes. You know, why are they so special? Well, they reproduce really fast. You can put that gene inside of those bacteria. The bacteria will reproduce really fast, copying that gene millions of times and uh, making a lot of insulin protein. Then you take it out. So how does that work? Well, here's a human cell, a eukaryote, and here's the prokaryote. So this is a human and this is a bacteria. So what we do is we go inside the nucleus and we look at the DNA. We find the insulin gene 
And that's our gene of interest. That's the special gene that we want, the insulin instructions. So that's our gene of interest. And what we have to do is cut it out. And we're going to talk about these scissors. We don't use actual scissors. These are more enzymes, so they don't look like this. But this is what they act as. They act as scissors. And they're called restriction enzymes. Restriction because they're restricted to a special location on the DNA. In other words, they'll only cut at a specific DNA sequence, as you'll see in the next video. So once we cut that out uh, with our restriction enzyme, which acts as our molecular scissor, then what we're left with are, are uh, sticky ends. You're going to see some fragments left over. We'll talk about that later. This comes very important. Then what we do is we look at the bacteria, and what we do is there's the regular DNA it has, um, which is all over the place. Remember, they have no nucleus because they're prokaryotes. But then they have another DNA, and this DNA is called the plasmid. Plasmid. So it's, it has two DNAs, uh, the regular one and then a circular ring of DNA also. And that's the special one that we use and it's called the plasmid DNA. Then what we do is we the same scissor or the same restriction enzyme we use to cut here, we use also the same one to cut here. You're wondering why is that so? Well, take a look at what happens. Once we cut once here, it opens it up and it leaves a nice sticky end that is complementary to this other one. So now you can just slip that one in and combine it. And we call this new DNA recombinant DNA. It's essentially the plasmid. And recombinant or hybrid means that it has two organism DNA in here. You have the one from the bacteria and then from the human. And that's the insulin gene integrated with the bacteria DNA. And then what's left is now we put that back into the bacteria. And we allow it to reproduce and clone and multiply and it's going to produce that protein and make millions of copies of bacteria and protein. And then you take out the insulin, put it um, in a bottle, and give it to your patients. Now let's take a look at a video that explains this a little bit better. Human insulin can be produced by transferring the human insulin gene into bacteria. The human insulin gene is bordered on each side by a specific sequence of bases, GAATTC. A special enzyme added by a scientist recognizes this sequence and cuts the DNA on either side of the insulin gene. This isolates the insulin gene and leaves two segments of bases on either side. These segments are called sticky ends because they will bind to DNA segments that have complementary bases. The insulin gene is now ready for insertion into bacterial DNA. Bacteria carrying the gene for tetracycline resistance are used to hold the insulin gene. Resistant bacteria are needed for two reasons. First, this gene is found on plasmid DNA. Plasmids are circles of DNA separate from the main strand of bacterial DNA. Second, the tetracycline resistance gene is known to contain the GAATTC sequence of bases. The plasmid DNA is removed from the bacterium and treated with the same enzyme used to cut out the human insulin gene. The enzyme cuts the plasmid DNA at the GAATTC sequence. The two ends are sticky, just like the ends on the human insulin gene. The insulin gene is mixed with the cut plasmid DNA. Complementary bases pair up. With the help of the enzyme DNA ligase, the DNA backbones are joined. The human insulin gene is now part of the bacterial DNA plasmid. The plasmid is then reinserted into a bacterial cell. Cells containing the insulin gene can be identified because they are no longer resistant to tetracycline. The resistance gene has been cut and no longer functions. The bacterial cell grows and divides. Each new bacterial cell produces human insulin from the human gene carried on the plasmid. The insulin is purified 
and used to treat people with the disease diabetes.